Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to Tom Bullicky, Senior Fellow for Global Health, Economics, and Development, and Director of the Global Health Program at the Council of Foreign Relations. Our topic is cooperation, or the lack thereof, among the nations of the world in the development of a COVID vaccine. Let's listen. Tom, thanks so much for joining me. We're in this situation now where countries around the world are investing enormous amounts of money in vaccine technology. And the companies themselves are issuing all sorts of press releases, a lot of them quite optimistic, saying that millions or even hundreds of millions of doses are right around the corner. What's wrong with this picture? So scientists and pharmaceutical firms are racing to develop uh, vaccine candidates uh, for this to address this pandemic. That's a good thing that there's uh, the amount of investment that we've had. Uh, The one part of pandemic response that has worked well in this crisis really has been the science. The genetic sequence was shared on January 10th. Within three days, they were already pursuing uh, vaccine candidates. Uh, Within 66 days of that genetic sequence being shared, a clinical trial had already begun. And it is quite possible that we may have efficacy trials completed by November within 11 months. Uh, That's remarkable. Uh, So it's a positive thing. Right now, there are more than 160 vaccine candidates being pursued, 25 in clinical trials, five in phase three efficacy trials. All that, again, is positive. What is not as positive is what these firms are doing so far is agreeing to advance purchase contracts with single countries. Uh, The challenge that you have there is that vaccine manufacturing supplies, or manufacturing capacity rather, is limited. And for the first months, maybe in the first year, uh, is going to be a finite resource. It will not meet global demand for a proven vaccine. And because of that, Early supplies will be used by one population, will not be available to others. So the question is, is if these companies make deals with governments to uh, provide all their early supplies, those governments in turn use it for even low-risk members of their population. It may be some time while health workers and more vulnerable populations in other countries have to wait to get the vaccine. Now, It takes two to tango. So on the other side of that transaction are the countries, um, which are certainly appearing to be pretty eager to make these exclusive arrangements. That's right. So fundamentally here, the main actors are the governments. That's for a couple of reasons. One, as you rightly pointed out, uh, these companies are making contracts with someone, in this case, government representatives. But secondly, at the end of the day, it is the governments that will control the supply of these vaccines. Why is that so? Because whatever the companies agree to in a contract, governments have the right to impose uh, restrictions on the export of supplies. They have the right to uh, impose restrictions on vaccines themselves. They can seize them through expropriation. This is not a fanciful prospect. This is, in fact, what happened in the early months of this pandemic when more than 70 countries plus the EU imposed export restrictions on personal protective equipment, ventilators, essential medical supplies, so that they could not be shared elsewhere. And it is very likely that we will see that happen in this case. So not only do you have company or governments locking up supplies where they can, we are likely to see governments, unless we can 
arrive at some arrangement to share, we're likely to see governments seizing supplies that were meant for other nations. So walk me through the problems with that. You know, uh, you mentioned one, which is that if government A is vaccinating very, very low risk people and government B has got got none, even for the very high risk people, you'll have more death than otherwise, for sure. But what else? That's right. So, and that's a big thing, of course. The major consequence of this is until the vaccine, or rather this uh, virus, is brought under control everywhere, it is, of course, a risk everywhere uh, in any country. That sounds like a cliche, and perhaps it is, but it is true in this case in a couple of different dimensions. The first is that early vaccines are likely to only afford partial protection. Uh, So they may not be entirely effective. They may be only, I think the FDA's guidelines require 50% effectiveness for approval so that many people still may get serious forms of this illness, even if they've been vaccinated. Uh, The amount of protection they provide, the durability of that may be limited. So it may be something where it, it only lasts a certain length of time. So high rates of infection abroad can, of course, uh, continue to cause health problems at home. Then there's the health and economic dimensions generally. So as you said, people will unnecessarily die in other countries. If health workers can't get vaccinated, health systems may come close to collapse. Again, not a fanciful suggestion. We saw that in places like Italy where their entire health system really largely shut down. And we've seen the knock-on effects of that for other uh, health conditions when the system is under such stress from the coronavirus that they can't address other essential health needs. Then there's the economic component of this as well. Uh, Even countries that have done pretty well in this pandemic so far, so let's take South Korea and Germany this week announced their economic numbers and they're, they're quite poor. Why? Because our economies are interconnected. And successfully controlling this virus at home will help only to a limited extent if it is raging in all your trading partners and export markets. So all those are reasons why we should care. The last point I will make is that if we are unable to cooperate on a vaccine that is in everyone's interest to share globally, and we mentioned on health from a health and an economic perspective, if we can't cooperate on that, what exactly are we going to be able to cooperate on as a global community? And that limits our ability to respond to and prepare for future pandemics. And I think I probably, like many of your listeners, will feel that I hope we've learned something from this crisis and better prepared for future pandemics. If we can't cooperate on this vaccine, we'll undermine our ability to work together for that, but also undermine the prospects for global cooperation really on anything else. That if in this moment of literally existential crisis globally, we could not work together, what are our prospects for working together on climate change or nuclear proliferation or any of the other issues that are going to require nations to make hard decisions and act in concert. So I want to ask you what global cooperation would look like. Like if you could redraw the boundaries of these contracts. My last question though is going to be how in the world we might get from here to there. But first I want you to explain like what it would look like for the world to come together and say, look, this is a threat to the human race. Let's take it on together. So the good news is there is a proposal out there that has promise. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation working with the CEPI, the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, and Gavi and the World Health Organization have created a facility called COVAX. And COVAX, short for COVID vaccines, is meant to provide a allocation that is driven by public health need as opposed to the size of a country's purse. And it does that by having countries effectively pay a subscription fee into this arrangement for vaccines. They have proposed a certain allocation around 20% of your needs being addressed through this, uh, this deal. And that would be a way of potentially uh, sharing. The reason why it works 
or it may work, is that at this point, nobody is certain which vaccine will succeed. So even a country like the U.S., which is spending billions to secure millions of doses in advance, none of those vaccine candidates may work. We have no idea at this point. We have not done the phase three trials. Lots of vaccines fail in phase three trials. So with, the, with that uncertainty, there's a prospect people might participate. Here's the challenge. That arrangement can only work if everyone is confident that other nations won't seize supplies. What we describe, we have a piece that is coming out in Foreign Affairs on the next issue. We describe this as effectively your classic prisoner's dilemma, where if everyone is assuming the other actors in the space are going to be non-cooperative, they will be non-cooperative too. The only way to shift what is a dynamic of non-cooperation to cooperation is reciprocity making there be consequences if countries do not participate and aren't cooperative. Fortunately, there are prospects for that happening in this case. So I appreciate that. How many countries have signed on to that COVAX concept? So we'll soon find out. They have imposed a deadline for subscription of August 31st. Uh, They had more than 140 countries express interest, formally express interest, in learning more about how this mechanism will work. So they are getting a serious look. The worrisome signs are that uh, in the meantime, the United States, the United Kingdom, just last week alone, entered into deals to lock up millions of vaccine doses, many millions. So the guiding thinking behind that kind of action is some sort of uh, policy realism, you know, that the, and I've read people say, we cannot let another country have a vaccine first. This is essential to our economic standing, our role as a superpower. It's us versus them. That's a pretty, you know, attractive line of thinking to some people. You know, it, it's, it's sort of the America first, Britain first, you know, whatever the particular country is, how do you combat that if you're trying to make the broader argument that things will actually be better for America or Britain if there's more cooperation? I mean, what, 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 that, to me, that seems like quite a barrier to overcome. It is. And again, as we mentioned, if the assumption behind those actions are that at the end of the day, every other country is going to behave like a nationalist, too. So why be the sucker and pretend otherwise? And the U.S. and the U.K. have headed in that direction. What was worrisome about last week is the EU, there was reports out of the EU that the commission, the governing body for the EU, is advising its member states not to pursue their own vaccines through COVAX either. That's a problem, given that the EU actually sponsored the launch of COVAX. So that's, that's a worrisome sign. Again, those are just press reports. So there's been no official statement by the EU. But if that is true, that is, that is worrisome. All right. So how do you get everyone to stop assuming everyone else is going to be a nationalist? The only way to do that, again, is through reciprocity. Where that exists in this case, two ways. The first is that there is not only going to be, there's not likely to only be one vaccine that succeeds here. We're likely to see several, and it very well may be subsequent vaccines are better. So that's the first piece. The second piece is global supply chains are unavoidably global. The U.S. is racing to reshore to bring as much of that in the United States as possible. They are not going to get there. They're not going to get there probably on glass files. And they're probably not going to get there, particularly for some vaccines on adjuvants. Those are substances used to boost an immune response because many of those are made right now entirely abroad. So we're going to be dependent on other nations, whether we like it or not. And if that dependence is is a vehicle, people refer to it, you know, politicians worry about dependence. But in this case, it's a feature because you can potentially rely on it as a way to get people to cooperate. And that's what we suggest. 
so you're you're kind of hoping people will be afraid that 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 their citizens might be stuck with a worse vaccine than a vaccine that's available abroad if you're not cooperating, for example. Yeah. So if you if you don't share your early vaccines for higher risk populations abroad, and let me be clear here, no one is expecting any government not to address their priority needs first. And that's appropriate and that nobody would expect that. The issue is in the United States or India, do we try to vaccinate everyone before being willing to share? And that's a problem because we will use up supplies. And if we lock in all those supplies for that purpose, it means there's less available for COVAX and other multilateral initiatives to try to secure in advance. And, and, and that political argument at the national level is, we want to be on the receiving end for some great other vaccines that may actually be better than the ones that we develop. That's right. A, and B, we don't want to be in a position where countries make it impossible for us to have a vaccine because they are making one of the ingredients that goes into it. That's exactly right. So those are the features. And the part two, this is, again, not fanciful. Countries have seized. When the U.S., as Josh knows, I come from a trade and health background, so I, I've done both. And um, when the U.S. imposed steel tariffs early in this administration, Peter Navarro, the president's strategic advisor on supply chains and trade, made a statement that we don't expect any country to retaliate against the U.S. for having done this. And within a week, they all had retaliated. <laughs> the European Union retaliated. Uh, Japan retaliated. Just up and down the line, countries retaliated. So it is realistic to expect that if we hoard and do not share, other countries will retaliate because that's what they do. In this instance, that provides a, if you can use an agreement, to give confidence that they will not seize local supplies, then you might be able to create a scenario where countries are willing to participate in a global arrangement because otherwise they're leaving self, themselves vulnerable to the behavior that, frankly, is mostly what people have done in this crisis. Got it. Well, I really appreciate your taking time to talk to me. It sounds like global cooperation is hanging in the balance and this August 31st deadline might be a, an important sign of what's to come. Certainly one to watch. Thanks so much, Tom. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, Cian Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening. Thank you.